uh, for example, if the person who's using nicotine, we don't hear them abusing others or hitting on others or causing extensive damage to property, anything like that. And then also nicotine is being vastly promoted by large multinational corporations. And people have, uh, are under the misconcept uh, that this can be stopped without treatment, which is a very big mis misconception to have. Only certain people, by luck, do stop it completely. So if you look at the history of uh, nicotine, nicotine's main source is nicotine tobacco. It is from South America. However, the name nicotine actually comes from the name of Jean Nicot de Belmay, a French diplomat who actually brought the plant to France in 1560. And it is all thanks to Heinrich Posley and Ludwig Riemann to have synthesized and isolated this nicotine from the leaves. Nicotine's uh, pure nicotine was first synthesized by a Swiss person called Aim Pictet. So this is the journey of the nicotine plant. You can see that plant with this flowers here. Only the leaves are taken. The leaves are dried out completely. Uh, they are aged over time. And then they are slowly crushed. And then we roll them into cigarettes or BDs or whatever form is that you want to use it. So there are two forms of nicotine in a cigarette. One is the free nicotine and the other is the bound form. The bound form is not per se very dangerous but the free form is. Now, when you smoke, what happens is that the fire and the added ammonia in it makes the free form even more volatile and gives it an immediate impact. The person who's smoking it will, the first puff itself will give you a release of nicotine and give you the desired effect. So it produces a very immediate impact. And this first effect will lead to more satisfaction. If you look at the pHs of uh, nicotine found in cigarettes is from 5.5 to 6.0 and in nicotine spit uh, nicotine spit is for those of people who don't know nicotine spit is basically small uh, you can call it tablets you can call it menthol like things small bags of uh, nicotine powder very fi fine powder of nicotine which you can keep it in your mouth and gives you the same effect as a cigarette and if you look at the cigar the ph of cigar is from 6.2 to 8.2 how much nicotine are we consuming when you are talking about any of the substances? So basically, there is 10 milligram of nicotine per cigarette. And out of that, up to 2 milligram is absorbed. In cigarette smoking, you can uh, find that uh, 10 puffs, this is what the average uh, person takes in 5 minutes. And in spit, there is one can is equivalent to three packs of cigarette and cigar up to one and a half one cigar is equal to up to one and a half packets of cigarettes now why are there different forms of tobacco simply because they have different addictive potentials and there is large amount of marketing saying that one thing is better than the other one thing does not produce addictions one thing is uh, tastier so on and so forth of the several forms of tobacco available cigarettes are the most addictive form they deliver nicotine very rapidly to the brain and the nicotine hit is directly associated with the activity of smoking. You don't need any time for the effect to come to your brain. It almost immediately starts and they provide other rewards which nicotine potentiates. Now there is the generation of smokeless cigarettes. Now this is the evolution of e-cigarettes. I hope you can see me. The first one is first generation. This is known as a cigar like. The cigar like looked exactly like a cigarette. It was a very big failure in the market because of its poor battery life. Uh, and uh, it was considered as a useless uh, uh, substance. Then came the second generation, which were called as a vape pens because they essentially looked like your ballpoint pen. And uh, it just uh, had much better battery life. Uh, and it is still used. Many people still use these second generation vape pens. And the third generation is the uh, larger uh, device. It is, uh, it had a more, uh, it gave the person who's using a more control over the waking, uh, vaping experience, but it never really caught on. Now we have the fourth generation, which is currently most of the people who can afford it are buying this. 
because you can uh, modify it is basically like having your phone you can customize it in any way that you want the fourth generation ones they can you can customize it you can change the coils you can change the wicks as per your desire now first generation uh, e-cigarettes are what people tend to start with initially but now since they were a failure people now all of them they started with the second and then move over to the fourth generation now how do these uh, cigarettes give you the the kick of the nicotine so basically the mixture used in vapor products such as e-cigarettes are called e-liquids and a typical e-liquid has propylene glycol and glycerin a 95 percentage of it is this and a combination of flavorings nicotine and other additives the flavorings may be yes as the fad is in food there is organic flavoring and uh, artificial flavoring available other than nicotine, you can find more than 80 harmful chemicals such as formaldehyde, metallic nanoparticles, etc. The latest trend, however, is not e-cigarette. It is something known as the IQOS. So you can find the image here, the Philip Morris International IQOS device. So basically, what is the device? Uh, it is uh, just like smoking. The only difference is, as we discussed the e-liquid is not used. In this, a powdered form of tobacco is used. Yeah. Instead of using the yeah. nicotine directly, they use a powdered form of tobacco. So basically, you can find these two individuals chasing a vapor, and this activity is known as cloud chasing. Uh, this actually is derived from the uh, from what you call as chasing the dragon. Chasing the dragon is what you find used to find in other addictions. Uh, like coke, cocaine, and also you find some in crystal MDMA, because some people use this uh, thing known as chasing the dragon. That is what is called because the waves look like a dragon. This is called chasing the cloud or cloud chasing. If you look at the epidemiology in 2002, there were 24% were the smokers uh, according to the world uh, population data. But however, it was reducing at the rate of one percentage per year in developed countries. Worldwide prevalence, men are far, far ahead that of women. Men uh, are 47% of users were men. If you look at the addiction in uh, UK, whether secretary addiction was controlled, if you look at the demographics and data, you will find that people who wanted to stop were 60 percentage when you should understand that most of them did not could not stop it even uh, though they wanted to if you look at the prevalence in india 28.5 percentage are in men 2.1 percentage in women lowest in punjab and the highest in mizoram at 42.9 percentage most commonest form in india is not cigarette it is the bd and uh, in affluent people yes it is now coming into e cigarettes Factors that propagate cigarette smoking include poverty, gender bias, male sexes usually use more cigarettes, and low educational status. Now, how does nicotine act? Nicotine acts on the nicotinic cholinergic receptors. These receptors are present on the mesocortical limbic dopamine-containing neurons, which basically forms the reward pathway. It is the same pathway that is implicated in OCD, same pathway implicated in gambling disorders, same pathway is implicated in other forms of addiction as well. So basically, it also has a noradrenergic effect on the locus cerulius. If you look uh, at again, nicotine, basically what it does is as soon as it enters the brain, it shuts down the receptor immediately. And this produces a mini rush. And the addiction of nicotine or this rush of nicotine is actually self-limiting. It basically ends after some time, does not give you a prolonged effect like what you would get in the case of an MDMA usage. And nicotine use, uh, users may actually upregulate their cholinergic receptors in the brain as well. So if you look at this, uh, if you uh, look at this, you can find that the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, uh, accumbens on in these areas, there is modulate, uh, there is uh, cigarettes actually modulate dopamine and uh, glutamate release. It also increases uh, norepinephrine and uh, serotonin as well in these areas. So what is found in a smoke other than nicotine? You'll find uh, butane, which is found in your cigarette lighter fluid. You'll find uh, battery content called cadmium. You'll find uh, hexamine, which is uh, barbecue lighter. 
you will find uh, stearic acid which is used in candle waxes toluene which is used as an industrial solvent uh, you will also find ammonia which is a very common content of uh, toilet cleaners and uh, uh, paint as well you will also find carbon monoxide methanol arsenic methane acetic uh, bits and traces of acetic acid as well now how does nicotine uh, go into circulation so basically when you use nicotine within 15 seconds it enters into your circulation uh, and and within a few minutes you will get your peak cns and uh, cbs effects and that is why people chain smoke because because of this effect it lasts for a very short time and the high is seen within in a very few minutes after you smoke so the, for the next time have to happen you will have to smoke again so people smoke one after the other, calling them chain smokers. Why do people smoke? Smoke uh, usually improves performance in anxiety related situation. It reduces your anxiety and actually helps you to perform better. So that is why most of the people actually start smoking. It also stabilizes your mood, reduces hunger. For example, a person who is working day in and day out and does not have enough time to take for himself or having food or lunch or whatever, get a puff and you're good to go and even if you smoke a large amount in a day there is no intoxication as such which will prevent you from doing your work so this is one reason one very key reason as to why cigarette smoking increases however in ch childhood in if you look at the history of people who use uh, cigarettes you'll find that these people start at a very young age why do children start there are several reasons. However, most important is the favorable peer family setup, the last reason mentioned in the slide. If you find uh, people uh, who have started smoking very early, you'll find that either their peers or their family members would be actually smoking or using one form of the tobacco or the other. Earlier, when tobacco use was uh, considered as cool or uh, it was considered as a, a macho uh, symbol, it, it probably in the 70s and 80s that also was a reason but now now how would uh, this uh, propagation of so tobacco as a macho symbol is not uh, seen so much also in children who are very rebellious who have uh, very uh, problems in following authority for example children who are having uh, oppositional defiant disorder children who are having contact disorder etc they start smoking at a very early age sometimes people do children do start smoking just to relieve them of of their uh, depressive symptoms as well so inhaled uh, nicotine is metabolized through the liver within uh, and uh, achieve, achieves its half-life within two hours. The peak arterial concentration is up to 60 nanogram per ml during uh, smoking. The effects on nicotine on CNS, it produces arousal or relaxation. It enhances the concentration. It suppresses your appetite. It increases the heart rate, blood pressure, and cutaneous. It causes cutaneous vasoconstriction as far as CVS is considered and uh, in produces catecholamine release as well lipolysis lipolysis with fatty acid release and increased energy expenditure is seen with cigarette use and there are several other effects which can go on for hours and hours now how to come to nicotine dependence as in the top topic proper the people with nicotine dependence have a certain tolerance now what is tolerance tolerance is basically when you start you start at very low amounts same as seen in alcohol you don't go and start at half a bottle or you don't start at three or four pegs in a day you start at a very small dose and it slowly builds up because the desired effect is achieved only after a certain concentration later uh, with later use and that is seen with uh, nicotine there are presence of clear withdrawal symptoms with cigarette smoking when you try to sm stop them which i will be discussing in later and uh, You'll find that people who are using cigarettes, they might feel the need to cut it down or the control the use of cigarette, probably due to family pressure or probably due to health concern, but they are unable to do so. And they spend a great deal of time on nicotine uh, usage and uh, procuring this thing. They use this despite knowledge of harm. Every cigarette packet as per law has this 
very graphic description of what is going to happen to you, but still people do use it. You find it before every movie screen, but people still tend to use it because there is this tendency to use despite knowledge of harm. Now, this in general is what happens with dependence, not just with nicotine, but with most of the substances. Now, what happens with nicotine withdrawal? What are the symptoms that you are going to face as clinician when your patient is going to stop it? One is depressed mood. Most of the people who stop nicotine abruptly will go into a certain amount of depression. People will come to you either in a depressed or a very dysphoric mood. Most of them will complain of insomnia. Probably most of the symptoms will be early morning awakening. As seen in depression, the same thing happens here. There is also irritability. The spouses usually complain that when he was smoking, he was a much quieter man, but now he's getting a little bit irritable. There is also anxiety, difficulty in concentration, uh, concentrating, restlessness, and there is increased appetite. Many people who stop uh, cigarettes suddenly tend to increase their appetite. It is also probably due to the fact that they resort to food or to eating to suppress their anxiety as well. So these are the things that you will find when you're dealing with a case of nicotine withdrawal. The symptoms of this usually begin within a few hours of cessation, increasing over three to four days and gradually decreases over one to three weeks. So the most important thing for your for, you, for the clinician as well as the patient is to understand that this is a long process. It is going to take some time. The hunger and craving can last for six more months. So even if you have stopped nicotine for say one month or two months, the craving need not go. The craving may persist and it may last for up to six months. The cravings are usually strongest in the first week and it is basically last for one and a half minutes in general. So people find that they need a cigarette. And if you can get over this one and a half minute, it will be fine. You will not smoke further until the next craving comes in. So as a psychiatrist, I'll also have to touch up on the uh, prevalence of smoking among mentally ill and uh, chemically dependent individuals. Schizophrenia, 80%. Percentage. 80% percentage of people with schizophrenia do smoke. And there are different uh, theories as to explain why this happens. In depression, roughly 60 percentage. In alcohol and other drug users, 69 percentage. Most of the people who take alcohol, most of them, at least a fair amount of them would be taking cigarettes while they are drinking. Now, nicotine and uh, mental health condition, if you, as I said earlier, into why schizophrenia uh, was so important because sometimes schizophrenia, it's, it's, it's basically like to be stuck in a conundrum because nicotine sometimes does improve some sim symptoms in schizophrenia. But however, whatever drugs that you're giving for schizophrenia, they will have a poor receptor action if your nicotine levels are high. So it's basically the patient is taking nicotine to reduce the symptom. But however, the symptoms, the drugs that you're taking to reduce the symptoms will again uh, fail to act. Also, tobacco in some cases do act as MAO inhibitor, MAO uh, inhibitors, and uh, activate psycho cytochrome P450 uh, enzymes. These are important because most of the psychiatric drugs have an issue with uh, interactions with uh, MAO inhibitors as also have a, a big uh, relation with cytochrome enzymes as to uh, how they are going to act. If you look at the mortality associated with smoking, there are at least 320 deaths every day from smoking in the UK. Uh, one out of five deaths across all ages are due to cigarette smoking. There are 4 million de deaths worldwide. So this is how the trend of uh, cumulative deaths are happening. So cigarette smoking is basically increasing. That is the upward trend. Even though the smoking usage has come down, the trend of death is increasing. So this I'll just pursue. So we'll get into management. Now, the first thing is who is ready to quit? Not everyone is going to be ready to quit. That is the most important thing. 20 to 40% of people who use nicotine would be very hesitant to quit and they would probably say to you, I am not intending on quitting. And this you will have to ascertain by something known as motivational interviewing. 40% of them will be thinking out of quitting. Like maybe my wife or my children are asking me, so I might quit this. Yes, 40% of them would be thinking about 
quitting and 20 percentage of them would be ready to come to you they'll request medicines they'll say i am going to quit you just help me so this is the stages of the change model or uh, how do you assess the motivation and how do you plan according to stages so first stage is pre-contemplation uh, i'll explain of what all these stages are in the coming slides the first stage is the pre-contemplation then it goes to the contemplation stage then there is a preparation stage then there is the action stage from which you go to the maintenance stage so from maintenance stage if you again relapse you again come back into contemplation but a few percentage from relapse would again go to pre-contemplation and we'll have to travel the cycle again so what happens in pre-contemplation stage basically the person is not ready to quit the person probably would these are the common statements from the uh, from your client that you will face i can't quit it will not happen to me and i enjoy it too much to quit so these are the things that you'll find in pre contemplation stage as clinicians your role would be push them from uh, to push them from the pre contemplation to the contemplation or determination stage so what you're going to give them are uh, the facts about cigarette smoking how it is has affected their physical health already and how it can further help them. And this will push the patient into something known as the contemplation stage. So here the patient is basically aware of the need to quit. Patient will say, I am, I am sure that I need to quit, but I am not sure how. Uh, I want to quit within this many days or my marriage is coming up or I have this interview. So I want to quit before that. My son's birthday is coming up. So they start you know, they'll start giving you hints as to when to quit. Then comes the action stage. Here, the patient is ready to quit. They will do as you ask them. They will take their medicines and they will uh, comply with all your instructions. And this will last approximately for six months. After this, you will go into maintenance stage. Now, maintain your work is not over even when the patient stops smoking. Your work is over only when he bypasses, when he goes through this maintenance phase and you have to keep them in this maintenance phase for a longer time. This person in maintenance phase will be continuously smoke-free. He will handle the temptation. There will not be craving anymore. He will be uh, the master of his own mind. Mostly, but most people would go into relapse. This is because once they stop smoking, they don't understand the importance of the maintenance phase and they would stop going to their treating doctor, stop taking their medicines, go back into relapse. Most of the people who smoke, uh, who stop smoking experience uh, this relapse. And mostly what comes along with it in at least some individual, they find this huge amount of guilt as to, uh, and they see themselves as a failure when this stage happens. So to uh, this I'll slip. This is this, this is the uh, flow chart. So basically, you have to understand. You have to put across five R's. So that is relevance, risk, reward, ro roadblocks, and reputation. So I'll discuss about it a little later. So the first question would be: Have you ever used tobacco? If it is yes, then you are just talking about cessation, and you'll tell them uh, just to think about it, and uh, we'll discuss it later, and then you move on to all the other stages that I mentioned later, okay? So cessation counseling, before you stop something, these are the five ways, ask, advise, assist, assess, assist and arrange. Uh, then there are other things like behavioral therapy, group therapy, which wouldn't be very feasible for you in your practice. So coming to what you can do, nicotine replacement therapy. So nicotine replacement therapy, if you ask me on a personal level, they, according to me, are now very effective. Studies do say, however, that they are effective. If you look at foreign studies, especially, they find that it is very effective. But then for Indian people, I don't think they are very effective because I've, uh, over the years of seeing these kind of patients, most of them do relapse with nicotine replacement therapy. However, it is available as OTCs. Uh, so basically... Uh, it reduces the withdrawal symptoms. So, so basically, it's a giving an easier way out. You're giving nicotine in a much safer way, in a non-craving uh, producing or a non-addiction producing uh, way. 
so transdermal nicotine patch nicotine gum nicotine nasal spray nicotine inhalers so if you look at the patches they are 16 hour 24 hour patches there are two kind of patches which are available in the indian market currently the starting uh, dose for the 16 milli uh, 16 hour package is 15 milligram and uh, 24 hour package is 21 so if you are smoking more than if your client is smoking more than 10 cigarettes per day you can use the uh, 21 milligram patch once daily for 6 weeks then 14 milligram patch once daily for 2 weeks and then 7 milligram patch once daily for 2 weeks this is known as the 21 14 7 regime okay and then if If your cigarette is less than 10, you can use the 14 by 7 regimen. So basically, it is instead of the 21 patch for uh, milligram patch for six weeks, you use the 14 milligram patch for six weeks and then the seven milligram patch for the next two weeks. Nicotine levels uh, are typically half, almost half, not exactly half, but almost half as to what you would get by your smoking. Now, the patient instructions that mostly the problem with nicotine replacements and including patches and your lozenges is that the instructions are very uh, important and most people skip the instructions. Uh, these are the instructions that you use in a patch uh, patient. One patch to be applied at a time to a non-hairy area where skin is not broken. Do not smoke when you're on the patch. Ensure the patient that the patch is delivering the adequate amount of nicotine for him. Rotate the patch to minimize irritation. You don't keep your patch at the same location again and again. It may cause skin irritation. Try to avoid soap uh, over the patch because it uh, increases the absorption leading to uh, the loss of efficacy of the patch very soon. Mild skin irritations are very common, but you can use topical steroids. And if you rotate it very frequently, then skin irritations are not that seen. Allergic reactions are very rare. Uh, some people, they do have the sleep disturbance when they use a patch. So in such cases, either you can remove the uh, patch at bed and that is the best option. If that is not working, if the patient would like that to continue, give them something to sleep with. Previous hypersensitivity to any form of nicotine replacement therapy is the absolute contraindication for this. Also, MI within six weeks, uh, arrhythmias, uncontrolled uh, hypertension, and active peptic ulcer disease. These are the relative contraindications, mild uh, or severe, moderate or severe hepatic renal impairment, uh, and then hyperthyroidism as well. Then comes to nicotine gum or lozenges. So basically what uh, happens in this, the, uh, the, the absorption is through the buccal mucosa and it avoids the first pass metabolism. There are uh, two varieties. You get it in India, four milligram and two milligram. The flavors, butka flavored and mint flavored are uh, available. You'll also get newer flavors like cinnamon and uh, mint and apple. So there are several of these flavors that are available. They are all OTCs. Your patient can buy them from any good supermarkets as well. Uh, if you're using uh, less than 25 cigarettes a day, it is recommended that you start with two milligram. And if you're using more than 25 cigarettes a day, it is recommended you use four milligram. Four milligram is what you would go for initially if the patient is using tobacco chewing. Don't waste your time with two milligram. You have to go straight to four milligram. So duration of treatment, should be at least four to six weeks and you'll have to slowly wean off this uh, after two to three months. So the patient instructions in this case, do not smoke while using the gum. Uh, something that is very important. Second is one piece at a time fixed schedule. So basically one piece per hour. You can't frequent uh, give it more frequency. You can't use two uh, uh, chewing gums in an hour. You have to use one and then you'll have to wait till you use the uh, for an hour till you use the next one. The most important instruction is the next one. Chew slowly till the tingling sensation. Maybe five minutes, maybe less than that. Once you get that, then park the gum for about 10 minutes. And then you repeat on the other side of the mouth. The parking of the gum is absolutely necessary. 
most people when they use nicotine chewing gums they say that it produces a very bad nausea uh, they get vomiting and uh, they get a very bad distaste in their mouth because they are using it like a normal chewing gum you are not supposed to use it like a normal chewing gum it is supposed to be parked and chewed chew it keep it on the side of your mouth chew it again do not eat or drink anything 15 minutes prior to using the gum so the side effects are basically as i said burning in the mouth and throat irritation happens when you chew it right out of the box just like a, a regular chewing gum there are uh, on, uh, precautions are usually usually during lactation coronary artery disease pregnancy etc then this is nicotine inhalers so it's basically it's shaped like a cigarette with nicotine cartridges inside them it is also absorbed buccally uh, you can use up to 6 to 16 cartridges per day up to 12 weeks and you have to taper slowly each cartridge has the same strength of that you would consider 2 mg uh, and also 4 mg is available so the dosage depends uh, uh, are exactly like what you'd use in the nicotine chewing gum as well then you have nicotine nasal spray so basically it de delivers nicotine more rapidly than any other dosage form one to two doses per hour for up to eight weeks and uh, eight to 40 doses per day the patients are not to sniff inhale or swallow the spray that is something that you should definitely tell them uh, that's not uh, supposed to be swallowed so non nicotine agents so these are the drugs that you can give so first one is bupropion hydrochloride uh, hydrochloride sustained release it is an antidepressant it is something that we all very commonly use not only in the case of uh, smoking cessation but also in the case of depression bipolar depression uh, in the new age addictions etc so basically what it does is it inhibits the neuronal uptake of norepinephrine and dopamine and thereby killing the pleasurable effect of nicotine so it reduces the craving towards nicotine and its efficacy has got nothing to do with antidepressant action so mostly what people think is when you use it your depression alleviates and you can stop smoking no it does, does not work that way uh, the nicotine action is entirely different from its antidepressant action so treatment is initiated when the patient is actually smoking you can tell the patient that you can smoke there is no worry you can smoke but after 2 weeks of beginning the tablets you are supposed to find your date and quit so initially you probably if the patient is having some gastric irritation or something you can start it at uh, once a morning dose 150 mg per day and then by the end of the third or fourth day or maybe even at the end of the first week you can start it at 150 mg bd dose be careful not to use more than 300 mg per day because it is of no uh, benefit uh, extra benefit is there if you use it more than 300 mg per day and almost always there is always a risk because this is an antidepressant it has got other side effects as well and there is also a risk of uh, bipolar mood disorder to be precipitated if you are using it in a person who has had history of mood disorder prior so continue for 7 to 12 weeks after the quit date and you have may have to maintain it at 150 mg od dose for up to 6 months so uh bupropion you can stop then and there there is no adverse effect and you the usual uh discontinuation symptoms with antidepressants is not seen so much with bupropion so the contraindications are seizure disorder eating disorders and pregnancy you should always uh, consider that there is a risk of lowering seizure threshold so that is why it is advised that these people do not take bupropion now varenicline the problem with varenicline or uh, shantix champex champex was available in india but the problem with it is now it is not available in india and it is darn expensive now there is only one company i think according to my knowledge one company which uh, manufactures varenicline very actively uh, i forgot the brand name i think it's called varnitrip yeah brand name is varnitrip i forgot the name of the company that is what is available in india currently it is expensive mind you but that is very good as far as all the medicines under uh, of uh, for smoking uh, cessation varenicline is definitely one of the best drugs available 0.5 mg once a day uh, for the first 3 days then 0.5 mg bd for the next 4 uh, days so that comes up the uh, makes up the first week and then till the end of treatment 1 mg 
two times per day. So Varnaklin also, when you start, you'll have to find a date, find a date and quote it as the quick date, make the patient note it down in his calendar, in his mobile phone or wherever that he finds it comfortable and ask him to stop smoking on that day. Varnaklin is uh, expensive. I think the one milligram tablet, uh, 10 tablets would cost roughly 800 and something rupees. So that is roughly, eight, I think 81 rupees per tablet. So make sure you mention to your patients that it is going to be a little bit an expensive affair. Then there are behavioral intervention like aversion therapy, Q exposure, which I'll not be boring you with. Uh, so relapse prevention, you have to find out the high uh, risk situations and avoid them. One is the wake up and toilet rituals. You ask most of the people who smoke very regularly, the first thing is they use this as a uh, probably a laxative. So stop that. Coffee and tea. Uh, most people use cigarettes along with these beverages. So ask them to stop this. Uh, make it a habit. These are the times baking uh, when you taking meals. You sometimes after meal after a dessert they'll probably have a smoke. So all these times you'll have to ask the patient or her so her spouse to you know. Uh, be cautious of these uh, events and to uh, control the use of nicotine. So this is how it is going to work. And yes, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is what the presentation is. Uh, and if you have any doubts, I'll be more than willing to answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bijay, sir. Thank you, Thank you uh, Dr. Arun. Uh, you have covered the topic uh, in very, very extensive detail, especially from the primary care pro practitioner's uh, point of view, people like us. Thank you for that exhaustive and very simple uh, talk. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, there were a few questions from the chat box. One of them was... Uh, uh, how do you counsel the patient and push them into pre-contemplation phase into contemplation phase? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir, for the kind words. Anyway, uh, coming to the question. So the first thing is you have to tell them about the... It, it, most of the people who are coming to you, they do know about uh, the harmful effects of uh, situation uh, of uh, cigarette smoking. But as a clinician, when you when you are going to discuss this with your patient, it produces a certain amount of there is a weightage to your words. So basically, you have to repeatedly tell them the pre-contemplation to contemplation stage is not attained in a day or a couple of uh, OP visits. It might take a long time. You might have to build a very good rapport with the patient. Then you'll have to slowly, uh, what is up with your smoke, your teeth are going colored, what device, your, your lips are getting colored, so you should probably cut down on your smoking. So once the patient is more friendly and your rapport has been established, the patient will actually open up to you. The most important thing is never be judgmental of the patient. Uh, the moment you're being judgmental, your rapport ceases to exist and the patient will probably consult somebody else or will never open up to you about the uh, problem that he's having concerning the uh, smoking. So that is how you have to smoke slowly. You have to start very slow, be very slow and slowly build the patient's trust. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, there were a couple of comments uh, from one of the listeners that uh, it's true actually to an extent uh, that we hardly find anyone who successfully quits. So uh, I, I believe uh, that the success of smoking sessions in therapy is about 30% uh, uh, if measured in terms of six months of quitting. Uh, and uh, like any comments on that? Yeah, uh, it's, it's very true. It's very true that, uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, many people think that they can stop smoking by themselves. That is probably the biggest victory of nicotine or the companies that market cigarettes. Because you really can't stop it by yourself. Very few people can stop it by themselves. The most important thing that I'd like to emphasize here is the importance of maintenance phase. 
what as psychiatrists, uh, what we find in nicotine cessation as well as in psychiatric disorders, once the symptoms have come down, the patient believes that it is over. Now this journey is over. I can say, uh, you know, bye to the clinician. I have stopped smoking. Yes, I have won the battle. No, the journey has only started because the longest part of the treatment is actually maintenance phase. You will have to continue to meet your physician. You will have to continue to taking uh, drugs probably for quite some time. So that is the first thing probably you should uh, let the patient know. Most of the people do not come because generally the principle is that if in the absence of symptoms, there is no illness. But then that does not hold true, at least in some cases. The absence of your smoking does not mean that you're completely out of nicotine dependence. It is going to take time. So the more you are in contact with the patient, the more the patient is religiously coming to you and taking medicines and coming up for follow-up, the higher the chances of quitting are. So that is why I said as during my presentation, I said the maintenance is very, very important. Thank you. Uh, there is one query that how do you choose whether to start on a nicotine replacement therapy or a drug therapy? Okay, uh, as a person who's uh, dealing with such patients, I would uh, say uh, definitely go for drug therapy first. I, I'll tell you why, because nicotine replacement therapy mostly, one thing is most of these things are OTCs. The patient never takes it very seriously. The moment something is available in a supermarket, you're giving them something that is available in a supermarket. The patient is going to think this is of no much significance. This is something that I can try out and probably stop. There is no seriousness to it. So I do give them the option. I tell them, yes, there are two options for you to quit. One is nicotine replacement and other is uh, these kind of medicines. And uh, I would prefer that you take them, but it is your choice ultimately. So most of them, once you have a good rapport, as I said, during your, uh, your question regarding the pre-contemplation to contemplation, most of the people who have a good uh, rapport with you would actually go by what your decision is. Even then, there will be a certain amount of people who are very reluctant to take drugs who will start with uh, your chewing gums and your lozenges. Chewing gum and lozenges do work in some people. It is not that they are really bad. It is just that uh, I haven't found them very useful as such. But then it do uh, it does uh, their work in some people at least. I mean, especially chewing gums. Maybe uh, lozenges not much because they have this habit of biting the lozenges at the end and produces a very bad sensation and is very sticky. So most people who use a lozenge probably will never use a lozenge again. So chewing gums. Yes, in some cases. As far as I am concerned, I would always go for the drug. I'll probably tell them the importance of this and stick with the drugs better. Um, you mentioned a few uh, um, nicotine replacement therapy methods. So uh, one thing which was new to me was about the Nicorette inhaler. So I just did a quick Google search uh, even as you were talking. And uh, uh, surprisingly, I found that people who smoke occasionally should not be using the inhaler, number one. And secondly, uh, you mentioned that people who are uh, taking some forms of nicotine, like patches, etc., should not be smoking at the same time. In the same line, someone has just asked a query that uh, can a person who is using pan masala continue to smoke or use nicotine replacement therapy? Now, the, uh, the idea of nicotine replacement therapy, as the name denotes, it's replacement of nicotine. So you're basically replacing the nicotine. You can't smoke, you can't chew, you can't do any of this. So you essentially what you're doing is you're giving them the same chemical, but at a very controllable at a very negligent dose and making the patient getting adjusted to this. The moment you ask them that it is okay to smoke, they'll find that the cigarette gives them a much better kick or the tobacco or the pan masala or the gutka, whatever it is that gives them a much better kick. 
and they'll never associate they'll keep on associating with this higher kick all the time and it produ uh, produces a very desirable effect this kick and the uh, chewing gum does not or the inhaler whatever it is that uh, the replacement that you use does not produce that high of a kick so basically the patient will slowly slip back into cigarette smoking again and uh, as far as the nicotine uh, inhalers are concerned it is not very common but it is there some people do use it it is not very common most people uh, people who have tried nrts they usually would be have uh, having experience with either chewing gum or a lozenge because that is more available and it's cheaper too okay fine so that uh, that gives us a bit of food of food for thought dr arun uh, one uh, request to dr ajay uh, Dr. Ajay Bind, uh, could you kindly rephrase your question? I, I think the question you have asked is not clear. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, Dr. Arun has answered uh, those queries, maybe not in an obvious form, but the answers are there in the discussion and in the class. Uh, if you could rephrase your question, uh, we would be very thankful. Um, then, uh, Dr. Ajay, um, and Dr. Arun, sorry. Um, like, uh, I, I found an in interesting observation in what you just said now, uh, that something is available over the counter and people might not give it seriousness. But, uh, you know, people like uh, us who deal in diabetes, for example, will be the best uh, people to counter that, that belief. Because in diabetes, at least, people will try everything outside the OP and outside the pharmacy before they start or contemplate on taking any any proper medicines to control the sugars so that's an interesting uh, uh, cross cross insight which you gave us regarding tobacco yeah and, that uh, is that is true the thing is uh, the same thing holds true in psychiatry as well see uh, as you said most people they are scared of medicines now, why they are scared of medicines, I feel that they are quite, uh, you know, most people are concerned about the side effects are going to be, how expensive it is going to be, how long do I have to take it for, so on and so forth. Uh, the moment you give them uh, something as uh, uh, what we feel as psychiatrists, the moment you give them something of an antidepressant or an antipsychotic of any, any, any uh, dose, the first thing they're going to do is they'll probably Google the symptoms and then they'll find some product which is either naturopathy based or some dietary modification and they'll then follow it as you said correctly during diabetes what you feel we face it in most of the psychiatric situations daily but however in nicotine this is what we feel because uh, most of the patients usually not the patients but the patient's spouses they come and say uh, doctor, that is something that is available in the market. No, so he, he does not think of it. So you tell him that it is not like that. It is some medicine. Uh, so yeah, that is it is very very funny to thing to have to have the same, you know, thing being viewed like separately, separate in two different angles. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Uh, okay. Practically daily, we hear. One second. I'll just read out a question again from Dr. Ajay. Practically daily we hear that today or tomorrow we will leave smoking. So how can we help people? Okay, I think uh, Dr. Ajay, that question has been covered uh, two times by now by Dr. Arun. That how to, that the stages of uh, any quitting any habit, like you have to identify which stage the patient is in or the person is in like pre-contemplation, contemplation, and so on. That has been very clearly identified. I'll move on to the other question which you have asked, although that is also not strictly within the purview of this topic. Uh, the question he has been asking has been, uh, today, nowadays, we find many females, uh, especially youngsters smoking. It's become a fashion statement. Uh, how does it help their, help their life, uh, like affect their life in future and their baby? That's a question which roughly is asked. Uh, I know, Dr. Arun, this is not. This is slightly beyond the topic of this. No worries, no worries. Could you kindly throw some sure, light sure, on? Sure, 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 sure. So basically, uh, what? Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, what you should understand is, uh, in girls, uh, it's a very common misconception that only boys do uh, drugs. Okay, that is very wrong. So basically, uh, all across, if you if you find if 
basically i'm practicing in kerala as you know so if you look at uh, the uh, amount of patients that we get most of the pe- uh, females or uh, the students uh, from colleges of young child be- uh, bearing age group uh, they do get uh, different uh, substances of use mostly it is cannabis these days that is what the fad is right now not uh, nicotine but however yes nicotine is seen uh, in some individuals at least as especially those people who are working in it profiles who have uh, have to stay up for late night for their work and uh, who cannot really you know to just reduce their hunger and all that yes we do see so however uh, the question is uh, as i think is uh, why it is important in a in a lady the thing is one thing it can complicate with the, your pregnancy it produce it gives you a very high chances of uh, abortions stillbirths it also produces significant amount of growth retardation and developmental delay in your child uh, including maternal health uh, during pregnancy is another uh, concern your vital capacity comes down there is also cases case reports if you can find you can find that uh, fetal death or uh, deaths within the first year of the baby's life infant mortality everything goes up when you uh, smoke uh, sometimes it can also uh, cause cardiac effects in uh, babies as well as uh, respiratory effects as well in the unborn child so yeah that i hope that is the answer that you are looking for yeah actually uh, just adding a couple of lines to this uh... i have always been interested in the history and evolution of medical science as we know it today and uh, in the same way uh, the evolution of or the de evolution of tobacco uh, companies and their advertising methods as late as the 1970s they, they, it was very common for tobacco companies to advertise the picture of a pregnant lady uh, nicely smoking blowing rings in the air and looking at the bump very 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 uh, longingly and with a caption which ran alongside the ad that mothers who smoke have cleverer babies with higher iq they have an edge over other students other children in school etc etc and the earlier you start your smoking the better it will be for the child i think from that point in time uh, at least the de escalation of aggressive advertising has uh, happened uh, very very remarkably over the last 20 30 years Uh, and it took us about 30 40 years of anti tobacco lobbying and campaigning for the tobacco companies to just accept that yes this is harmful and then another 20 30 years of lobbying uh, to get the gory looking images on the packets uh, the warnings came slightly earlier but the images came very very late very recently uh, yes there might be a increase in the incidence of smoking in young females in the recent years because of uh, it being also having connotations of liberalization and uh, you know gender equality and all perhaps the only uh, thing which is going in the wrong direction from that point of view um, but i think in the last 20 30 years there have been very positive strides which have been made uh, to uh, as some of our readers have been commenting and wishing um so i think uh, you have answered more all the questions and beyond uh, even the purview of the topic today in this discussion uh, thank you dr arun for such a very clear and uh, very uh, interesting topic presentation and addressing all our queries thank you thanks a lot if any uh, any of the audience members have anything to ask in particular i think we can take a couple of questions more uh yes sir i, I need to ask one question yes please proceed uh, uh, sir uh, 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 how long or is there any quantification that how this much dose or this much cigarettes uh, cause dependency sorry like uh, how long it take to get dependency nicotine dependence or is there any quantity yeah so uh, dependence dependence is basically a function of your brain 
So it is, you really cannot pinpoint as to how many drinks can I have before I, I, I can be declared uh, alcohol dependent. Similarly, you cannot say that I have smoked sim uh, similarly this many cigarettes, so I am now dependent or I am not dependent. So dependency, basically, it's a function of your brain. So once you, uh, if you look at uh, alcohol dependency, you'll find a questionnaire called CAGE questionnaire, C-A-G, about annoyance regarding when you're asking, uh, do you get annoyed? Uh, can you cut down? Uh, do you feel guilt? So there are other questions like that. Similarly, nicotine dependence also forms like that. So you have to prioritize your nicotine use above other pleasures in life. You will get annoyed when people question you. You will continue nicotine use even when uh, you find it harmful and people have shown, shown you the evidence that it is harmful. You will develop tolerance and uh, withdrawal to nicotine. So all these things do not uh, start with a particular dose or the particular amount of nicotine. It is basically a function of your brain. So it differs from individual to individual. Okay, sir. Understood. Right. I think uh, uh, we have covered most of the topics uh, and the queries. And thank you, Dr. Arun, again. Thank you for to the organizers. I hand it over to Dr. Aishwarya and the organizing team to take this meeting forward. Dr. Aishwarya. Okay, thank you very much, doctors. I request Dr. Devanan, Treasurer AFPI Kerala North Zone, to deliver the vote of thanks. Dr. Devanan. Dr. Devanan, currently working as assistant surgeon. Am I audible? Hello. Ah, uh, yes, Devan, you can. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Hello. Uh, I hope everyone had an enlightening session. First of all, I would like to extend my uh, sincere gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. Arun, for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and I am sure that this session has enriched our understanding and not on smoking cessation, and this will improve our uh, clinical approach in future. Next, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bujera Saragi for uh, chairing the session. Uh, I thank Dr. Eshmi Ma'am and Dr. Ma'am for the keen interest in attending the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prashok, uh, for his welcome address. Uh, I thank Dr. Aishriya for anchoring the session. Uh, I thank our Secretary, Dr. Nikesh, and the Northson team for organizing such a wonderful uh, academic session. Special thanks to Dr. Navina uh, for her excellent posters. Uh, I also thank all the participants uh, who found time to attend this uh, session and make this a huge success. Uh, hope to see you all uh, next month again with a new.